In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we're gathered here to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first remember our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned, thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord be with you. Thank you. Let's pray. Oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong and nothing is holy, multiply your mercy on us that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this morning is from Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. 
You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle this morning is from 1 Timothy chapter 1. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, pointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory Glory to you, Lord. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she found it, she has found it. She calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours on this Father's Day in the name of Jesus. Amen. So glad to have all the fathers who are here and everyone else on this special day. And when we have a gospel reading like this that is so very familiar, I'd like to take it and apply it to fathers and to those who are going through difficulties. And we can do so in the reading that is chronologically the last of the four. And by the way, today, the psalm reading, the psalm for the day, is Psalm 103, summarized in the hymn we sung in between the Old Testament from Micah and this, our sermon text from the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit to a young pastor named Timothy. Timothy was in a place where he needed encouragement. And with God's grace and Holy Spirit, as well as from the pen or mouth of the Apostle Paul, we hear God's encouragement to Timothy, but also to fathers. And not only to fathers, in particular, to all Christians who have been working for Jesus. This is primarily a message to believers, to Christians. However, it's quick to include anyone who is not yet calling Jesus my good shepherd and know him as your savior and your king also. You know, there's a lot of work to be done. And it's clear or you get a hint of it, or you feel the need every time you watch the news. Every time you go out the door, every time you sometimes even get a phone call. As I go through the uh, prayer list that we'll be praying in just a few moments, there are needs and heavy needs and serious needs around us. And God has called not only his Holy Spirit and his mighty angels, but he's called Christians. Those of you who are baptized in Jesus' name or who believe in him, and you have work to do on God's behalf in this world. Sometimes the weight of this responsibility is heavy and burdensome. 
perhaps as it was for young Pastor Timothy. Yet in the midst of the charge for Timothy, who was to clean up problems in the early church with false teaching, to get things right, to sort it out, to make sure God's people and fathers, as well as mothers and others, are teaching their children and those around correctly. No, none of us have done that perfectly. Not as fathers or mothers or in any other role. Yet, the good shepherd, in the midst of all this, and here's where I can sneak over to Luke. And I think this is such a familiar reading for most of you that I can just name it outright. That Jesus is the good shepherd who leaves 99 who are doing well or at least think they are, and he goes after one that's lost. This is a good shepherd. Presumably there are others to help with the 99. He doesn't leave them helpless. Yet his heart and his passion is to go after the one that is lost. Well, when Paul is calling to encourage Timothy, kind of in the midst of it, he erupts with this word of thanksgiving. That is, it almost sounds like an interruption when Paul says, as read in our text from 1 Timothy 1 verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. What's so shocking about this? We go on to hear why Paul is exploding almost with joy, with thanksgiving that he is one of those who was lost. He is the one who has gone astray. He is the one, he will will hear him say, who is the least of those who deserve it. He says, verse 13, and you remember, if you would, from the book of Acts, his background. You know, he was passionate for his faith and thought that he was standing up for God by persecuting Christians. Those of what looked like a cult following this man from Nazareth named Jesus. Paul was the one, and sure, perhaps we should call him Saul, his first name, given name, who was even holding the cloaks or coats of those who first-handed took up rocks and stoned a man named Stephen, a righteous and devout, the first deacon we would call him, who was serving Christ in the early church. And so in verse 13, Paul says, Why is he erupting in joy? Though formerly, I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. Paul names himself and calls himself the worst possible sinner, the chief of sinners. By the way, that would make a great hymn, wouldn't it? Chief of sinners, though I be. Paul says, I am the one who's lost. I was the one who was astray. I was the one who spoke against God in his face. I spit upon the Savior. Now, you and I may not feel that we're in that position, but I think Paul is persuading us that we were in that position or maybe by our old sin nature, still are. That we so easily, and just like Saul, who's transformed into Paul by the power of God's word and his grace, that we are that one. Why is he so shocked? Why in the midst of this charge to Timothy does he erupt with thanksgiving and joy? Because this is the power that we need today to live well, 
to live gloriously in the light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why was he so shocked? He says, verse 13, but I received mercy. I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. That is, he was not yet to the point that we would call the sin against the Holy Spirit where he would be sent to hell. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit was still at work at this time. And Paul gives all the credit to God and his spirit for bringing him. And he says this in verse 14, not only mercy, by the way, you know what mercy is? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Paul says, I am the one that deserves to go to hell. I am the one who's guilty of the worst sin. I don't deserve this. That's mercy. All through Jesus Christ, he's given both mercy and then at verse 14, and the grace of our Lord. You know what grace is? Grace is a gift that you have been given that you didn't earn. So, you know, mercy is holding back God's wrath, righteous wrath that's deserved. That's mercy for those of us who are baptized and believe. Grace is a little different, even though they go together. Grace is a gift that I did not earn that's been given to me. Yeah, they're like two sides of the same coin. In fact, mercy and grace go together like, like they're connected, like, like a cross. Mercy. And now grace Grace of our Lord, verse 14, that overflowed for me with a faith to believe all this, to receive it, and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul is exploding with this joy that's needed for those of us today who realize we're in a world that's filled with sin. And concluding our old sin nature, we have these internal battles in our own souls as well still don't we? But here in the middle of it is, is thanksgiving and joy because of what God has done, because he's the good shepherd, that he came after me, that he rescued me, that he gave me both mercy and he also gave me his grace. If that's not enough just to make it to heaven, you know, and then Paul is raised up to be an apostle. And he says, like one abnormally born, not like the other 11 or 12 before Judas is lost. No, not like the other apostles who walk with Jesus in person. His was abnormally born because, you know, he was on the road, you know, to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him directly and called him, knocked him off his horse. Remember that story? So his is a strange and unusual one. And he says, I don't deserve this. Yet God gives it. You know, if you're at this dangerous point of being discouraged because of all the problems in the world or maybe problems in your own heart and soul, they build up, they go against you. They weigh you down. You know, it's, it can be a terrible burden to take up this cross daily, sacrifice or put to death the old sin nature and to go Jesus' way. But that's exactly what Jesus has in mind for you who are baptized in his name. Now to be his light, his truth, his presence, and to share this good news with the world. Paul says, I can't do this myself. I couldn't. But... Thanks be to God. Paul is bursting out with thanksgiving. And even here, some joy of salvation because of God's, both his mercy and his grace given to you. Oh, my goodness. This saying is trustworthy, and he sums it up, verse 15 and deserving a full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul names himself the chief 
sinner. We are led as we read the scriptures, as we know his word, as we hear him say that all have fallen short of the glory of God, to count ourselves with Paul, that we too are the ones for whom Christ was nailed to the cross. We too are the ones who help swing the hammer. We too with Paul are the ones that spit in the face of God's son going to the cross by our own sin or our old sin nature. Yet, mercy in not giving you his judgment and giving you love instead. Grace in giving you your baptism, which calls you, gives you faith to trust that what he has done for you is true, that he has taken your sins, that he has washed you clean, that he has taken your sins and sent them to the depths of the sea, or as far as the east is from the west. This is what God has done for Paul and for most sinners like me. I'm one of those. I'm the chief. I had a heart like a devil and born with it. But God did something marvelous. And he's transforming us through our baptismal grace to want to participate even with him. This good shepherd who goes after the one who's lost. Find one who will admit, I'm a sinner, I need help. That's the one. And God is not done with us yet. He's not done with those around us in this world yet. He's left us here for this purpose because he is doing his work in us and through us and for us. No, not just pastors and career missionaries or church workers but every member of the body of Christ, everyone who's baptized in his name. You know, you have an important, can I even say most important job? I think fathers and mothers maybe have the most important job. A pastor, I'm just backup. I'm here to support and encourage. But you mothers, you fathers, have the most important role to set an example for your children and keep speaking the love and truth of a savior who comes for you. Your job is important, but like Timothy, you can't do this alone. Like Paul, you can't do this alone. We need the realization again of how he has brought us. We are the one lost that I am, and that you are, apart from Christ. And that similarly, he came. God came in our flesh and took our sin upon himself. This is what changes the ball game. You go back to work tomorrow, or when you leave the building, or maybe not even go that far. Your vocation also is here with one another, and Before you get to the car and home and all you'll do on Father's Day and back to work and et cetera in this week, everything you do as a Christian is important. You're representing Christ now. But thanks be to God, it's not because I have this or we have this in ourselves. It's because of his, what is it? It's his mercy and his grace. That changes everything. You go back to work, but you go back a different person after you understand what happened in your baptism, after you taste of his gifts, receive his true body and blood for forgiveness of sins. Verse 16, as we conclude, but I received mercy for this reason that in me, Paul says, as the foremost or the first of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. You see that in verse 16 there, he has you and me in mind. The Holy Spirit inscribed this. It is so you'd have an example here for those who were to believe. If you've come to believe in Jesus, this is for you. If you haven't come to believe yet, it's about to be for you. It is still for you. And it's written in scriptures and given by the Holy Spirit 
so that we receive it now. We need it to be the light of the world that only Christ could be. Yet we're sent in his name. I want to close with verse 17. God has done this. He in Christ is the good shepherd. He has brought us, filled us, empowered us, and is sending us to our daily vocations to love one another, to serve one another as a teacher who loves a student and wants to help them to learn to know the God who created all things and gives all things. As an engineer who's building and creating both for his community and those who are your clients, customers, neighbors, friends, and your own family. Those of you who serve in any occupation, those of you who are children and learning about God's world and how to love and serve him. Those of you who are fathers, who are to lead an example in faith and to share this message with others. Well, it's an overwhelming task to be a father, but God sent us to do that. It's overwhelming to be a mother and a parent and a friend and encourager in these days. But thanks be to God, as Paul realized, and as we realize again in this gospel grace. Verse 17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So his peace and joy keep you this Father's Day and every day, Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.